So we begin again. Um, this is on the, you know, continuing on to quadratic integers. And so we've looked at the Gaussian integers. They're really a specific instance of this idea. Uh, more generally, I suppose, you could look at something like z adjoining the square root of d, where d is square free, you know. And um, this would be something like, you know, well, this is a um, plus uh, b root d, right, such that um, a and b are integers, right. And here I'm assuming d is positive, you know. But I think you can also look at these, right. In fact, that's the kind of thing we just looked at with the Gaussian integers, you know. Um, I mean, we can write it as bi root d, right? So for any of these, you can define the norm of a, um, you know, either a plus b root d, and that's going to be a squared minus um, db squared, or in this kind of one, you do a plus um, b squared to minus d. Um, well, let's just call this thing, it, it's a squared plus db squared, all right? But um, in this case, you could still call this alpha, right? And it would still be the case that this is equal to alpha alpha bar, all right? And um, uh, let's see here. So um, I believe you can still prove that the norm in this case it's still multiplicative. All right, maybe I'll make that a homework problem. That actually sounds like a kind of fun homework problem for you guys. But um, actually, I think we're going to be mostly focusing on this case and what remains here. All right, but my point is that since the norm is essentially it's still multiplicative. Um, so like a lot of the norm divisibility theorems, they're still with us. Um, and these kind of number systems are tailor-made to solve other problems. All right, so rather than blathering on about properties of the number system, I'm going to just skip straight ahead to the application. And I think you'll find the argument I'm about to give familiar. So we're trying to solve y cubed equals to x squared plus 2, um, as, the, as Stilwell tells you know, the question, this was a question Diophantus um, studied, and he found many rational solutions, rational number solutions of this equation. And he also found the integer solution, x equals 5 and y equals 3, right? Known to Diophantus, yeah? So you might, you, you probably can guess, um, who then picked the, pro picked the problem up again. Um, well, six, for Ma in 1657, he claimed that there does not exist any other solution. So for Ma, 1657 said, this is it. This is it for, for Z. All right. Again, there are many rational solutions that was known, but for integers, Treating this as a Diophantine equation, that's it, Fermat claimed. Um, as usual, Euler actually proved the claim in 1770 by assuming the unique prime factorization of z adjoined square root of minus 2. So let's look at his argument. Let's look at Euler's argument. What do you think the argument is? Uh, no, no. Um, so we're going to work in... So Euler said, use z adjoin the square root of minus 2, right? Or you could look at this as z adjoin i root 2, if you prefer. All right. So if, if we have that, we can factor this. See, that's x um, plus i root 2 times x minus i root 2, right? And you can argue that these are relatively prime. And 
in um, in z adjoin root two times i. And so you got a pair of relatively prime Gaussian. Well, there excuse me, I got Gaussian on the brain. You got a pair of relatively prime. We need a name for these. We'll say they're um, algebraic numbers. That's kind of the generic term. A pair of relatively prime algebraic numbers. And they're equal to a cube. So what's that say? That says that they most must both be cubes. So that says that there exists M and N, or I guess I used A and B in my notes. A, which I use. Yeah, A and B in Z, such that what? Such that um, X, um, do, do, do. Hmm. Well, I use the minus for some reason, so I'll stick with it. X minus I root 2 is equal to A plus I root 2 times B cubed. So do the algebra. What do you get? You do the algebra, and what you get is A cubed minus 6AB squared um, plus parentheses. Well, I'll do an I here, parentheses, um, 3A squared B minus uh, 2B cubed square root of 2. And I missed my y, right? There's a y here, right? I'm sp oh, no. I'm an idiot. No, there's no y. And that's actually very interesting, right? Because that says that minus 1 is equal to 3a squared b minus 2b, 2b cubed, right? Which is, by the way, b times 3a squared minus um, 2b, 2b squared. What does that say? You, you, let's, put, let's put the minus 1 over there. Okay, there it is. This says B is a divisor of 1, right? So that means B is what? Either 1 or minus 1, right? So it could be plus or minus 1. But what else do we have? We have that 1 is equal to a cubed minus 6ab squared, right? See that from the real? So, oh wait a minute, I don't know that. My bad. That's just x, right? I can't say that that's 1. Hmm. My bad. How about this? We can still we can still glean more from from the fact that this is equal to this, right? That means that if b is equal to one, then two b squared minus three a squared must be equal to one, and if b is equal to minus one, then um, 2b squared minus 3a squared must be equal to minus 1, right? Because if you get 1 here, it's got to be 1 times 1 or minus 1 times minus 1. Them's your choices, right? But we can, we can improve on what I wrote there. What do we actually have? This is 2 minus 3a squared equals to 1, and the other one down there is 2 minus 3a squared equals to minus 1. So what do we get? We get um, we get 3 and we get 3a squared equals to 1 and the second equation gives us 3a squared equals to 3. 
So the first equation has no solution in z, right? And the second equation says that a is equal to plus or minus 1. Oh, man, that is not what I wanted to find. Just a second, I've made some kind of mistake here. So I say thus, 2b squared minus 3a squared equals 2 minus 3a squared. So 2b squared minus 3a squared equals the minus 1. So what does x equal? Oh, I'm a dummy. That's fine. Um, I'm just trying to show that the advantage is found the only solution, right? Right, my, 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 um, the error of my thinking, I was looking for the a plus ib to be the solution, but that's not the case. x is the solution, and x is equal, well, x is part of the solution. Um, and what's x equal to? See, x is equal to a cubed minus 6ab squared, right? So the, the b plus or minus 1, um, either way you slice it. Well, we, we, we figured out that b equals to 1 actually leads to nothing. So b equals minus 1, right? b does equal to minus 1. That's what we found. But we, we have a equals to plus or minus 1, I think. b equals to 1. I mean, that's what we're stuck with. So this is actually equal to 1, either minus or plus 6, right? So you either have um, well, you either have five or seven, I guess. No, minus five in my current, or seven is what I'm getting. But he's got minus one plus six. I don't know how. Minus one plus six. I don't know how he chooses a equals to minus one. Like, how, what gives him a equals to minus one? For some reason, he's choosing a equal to minus 1 here. Um, well, we can choose a equal to minus 1. Yeah, it's definitely a, it's a choice we could make. And then make minus 1 plus 6 because of the cube. And then you get the negative, negative. Yeah, how did I get minus 5? I think I just did the wrong math. So that, that should be <laughs> minus 1 plus 5. Yes, thank you. And this should be, if I do the plus, I should get 1. Um, Minus six. So okay, that's better. I get five or minus five. Okay, that that that. Thank you. That's much more reasonable. I can see a reason we should get five or minus five, right? Okay, fine. So we'll we'll, we'll choose the five. And so, great. Um, so uh, so we have five plus i root two times five minus i root two. Right? That's supposed to be equal to y cubed. So what's y? Well, this works out to 25 minus 2. And then the, uh, the imaginary parts cancel. Actually, it's not minus 2, is it? When I, I can't do math today. Plus 2, right? So we got 27 equals to y cubed. So y equals 2, 3. And so there we go. Uh, 5 comma 3 is solution. And since we did this algebra correctly, it's the only solution. This was Euler's proof. But it assumes the unique factorization, right? It assumes the unique factorization theorem that, that algebraic numbers can be written 
as a distinct product of primes up to unit multiples. So why, you know, I keep saying that that's something to concern us. Let me show you why that's something to concern us. All right. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm skipping over like page two in my notes. Page two of my notes, I just proved that, in fact, there is a division algorithm for, for these algebraic integers. Um, so it's, and the proof is very similar to the one we gave for the Gaussian integers. And um, I guess one other thing that's worth our time before I go on past the Z adjoin I root two is what are the units in here? So you're looking for norm of a plus i uh, b times root 2, right, equal to 1. That's going to give you the units for the same argument we gave before um, in the Gaussian integers. We have to have norm 1. And um, as such, that gives me the equation a squared plus 2b squared equals to 1. Well, you can't solve that if b is non-zero. So we only get solutions a equals to plus or minus 1, b equals to 0. In other words, minus 1 and 1, these are the units. There are only two units in z adjoin i root 2. In contrast, we had what? We had four units in the Gaussian integers. So that's another thing that will vary as we go from case to case here as we look at algebraic numbers, different cases, like different ones of them have more or less units. They always have at least one and minus one. Like that, that's not debatable. All right. So you can talk about um, the greatest common divisor and all that. And if you look at pages three to four of my notes, I give some um, explanation as to why conjugate factors have to be relatively prime, which was important to this argument. Right. And I say that completes Euler's proof that you know, x congruent to 5, x equal to 5, y equal to 3 is the only solution um, to this problem. All right. So, moving on here, I want to talk about another, um, another case. I guess I should just, let me pause here before I go on to the next page. There's just a minor point I should make. If we were to study, if we were to study um, the if we were to study z adjoin the square root of two, that would be a plus b root two, you know, a and b integers. And if we looked at the norm of a plus b root two which, by the way, is equal to a squared minus 2b squared, right? So look at what's, what are the units in here? Well, the units in this number system are the ones which have norm 1, right? So I set that equal to 1. Um, how many solutions are there to that? Yeah, the minus, notice that minus, that puts us back. Before test one, we talked for about an hour about Pell's equation. Yeah. That's a Pell's equation with n equals to 2. There are infinitely many solutions. Yeah. So this, this has infinitely many solutions, infinitely many units. So this stuff I'm saying, um, a lot of the nice stuff I have to say, they really apply to the case where we're looking at, um, you know, when you're joining i times the square root of something. Um, if you adjoin a real square root, those things are actually much uglier, and there are, there are, there are open questions in these things. I believe there are there's more open questions in that realm of the algebra. All right, so here we go. So back to the happy place. Z adjoin, although this is not as happy a place as the two places we've already been, square root of minus 3. So I would say you could also advertise this as Z adjoin I root 3. I kind of like that better. Um, so things in here look like they have the form a plus i b root 3. So these are algebraic integers, again, formed by taking... So what we say is we say we take z 
and a join i root three. Okay, that's that's what that is. Um, and and more specifically, the square brackets. Um, it's it's the ring that's formed by adjoining it. If you put parentheses, that means something else. All right. So the square brackets are important, actually. So. Um, if you think about the logic of things, it's still the case that if the norm, what's the norm here, by the way? What's the norm of a plus i b root three? It is square, mm -hmm. three b not minus this time. Plus, yeah, yeah. yeah, yep, three b squared, right? That's the norm here. It's still the case that the norm, so it's, we're still using that the norm of alpha is alpha alpha bar, right? And because all of the properties of the norm followed from the properties of complex conjugate in the complex numbers, all of those results we have still are there. However, <laughs> so one of the, I mean, we still have the result that um, if the norm of alpha is equal to P, um, a prime in Z plus, right? Then what? Alpha is prime in Z adjoin square root of minus three, right? Um, all fine. For the same reason we gave before, right? Prime norm implies prime. Of course, the converse is going to fail here just the same. But anyway. So, all right, so here we go, 4 is equal to 2 times 2, right? But it's also equal to 1 plus i root 3 times 1 minus i root 3. Now, unfortunately, I don't think I can use the little theorem I was just mentioning up here, you know. That doesn't actually help me here, does it? Because these norms are what? Like, this, the norm of 2 is 4. The norm of 2 is 4. 4 is not prime. The norm of 1 plus i root 3 is what? Uh, three plus one. 1 plus 3 times 3. I don't think so. So here I have a, oh, my bad, thank you. Very good. I, I was getting sucked into thinking b was three. I don't know what's wrong with me. You're right, b is one. a equals one, b equals one, so the norm is four. So this has norm four. That has norm four. Okay, well, I mean, fine. But um, what are the units? What are the units in z adjoin square root of minus 3. I guess we need to figure those out, right? Because we, don't, we, can't figure out, we can't figure out if these are just unit multiples of each other until we know. I mean, if, if, if 2 was a unit multiple of these guys, then we'd still be fine. We'd still have unique factorization. But what we're going to argue is that these are not unit multiples of each other. These are two distinct factorizations of 4 into relatively prime factors. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's not, I can't, these are not relatively prime. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> excuse me. So we need to solve a squared plus 3b squared equal to 1. So same as, like, same song and dance as the last one we did. Can't have b non-zero. So the units are a squared equals to 1. So plus or minus 1 units here. 
That's it. Right? So then what? Right. So, um, all right, so let's see here. Here's his argument that the norm of 2 is equal to 4, right? And he said, and a squared plus 3b squared um, is not equal to excuse me, does not divide, rather, for, except what? Except for a squared plus 3b squared equals to 1, which means that is a unit. So, So he's, you know, he's supposing, like, let's just write out something. Suppose 2 is equal to alpha beta, right? Then norm of alpha, norm of beta would be equal to, you know, um, norm of 4, which is 16, I suppose. Um, So that would mean that 4 has to divide um, does 4 have to divide them then? Wait, wait, wait. 2 is equal to alpha beta and alpha beta can only be 2 or 1. I'm an idiot. What's 2 squared? 4. four. Dummy. My bad. Yeah, so n, n alpha and beta either has to be, you either have 1 and 4, right? You have 1 and 4, you could have 2 and 2, you could have 4 and 1. Them's your choices. Um, but I guess norm of, norm is the norm equal to 2 even possible here? It's not. You can't have norm 2. That's an impossibility with the, 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 the formula for the norm. So we're forced, to, we're forced to have one or the other of them to be 4. Um, if one or the other of them is 4, that means 4 divides them. 4 divides a squared plus 3b squared. But his point is that a squared plus, 3B, a squared plus 3b squared does not divide 4 unless it's, unless it's, unless it's equal to 1. How does he know that? How, how do you know a squared plus 3b squared? You, you'd, you'd consider it mod 4, right? So you, you, you'd actually look at this equation, a squared plus 3b squared congruent to what mod 4? And you can look at different cases, and no matter what you do, you don't get what? You don't get... Uh, Zero. Or I mean, two or three. Two or three, yeah. So, I mean, we can try it out. Wait a minute, I think I get three. Can I put a equal to zero? Why can't I put a equal to zero and b equal to one? Is that not a thing? I mean, that would be. I mean, that would be square root of 3. B, B equal to 1, not a unit. B, B equal to 1. A equal to 0. B equals to 1 means alpha is equal to, you know, I root 3.
Oh. But I. But I guess that. I can't. Pro I guess I probably can't get two. Equal to i root three times something to work. Maybe. What's that say? That says that uh, that's going to force. Um, that's going to force c to be zero. And two is equal to. That just doesn't work. Yeah. So that's why that doesn't matter. There's a bunch of case checking to do here. Okay, let's just say that. I, 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 I don't. I'm not terribly interested in it. <laughs> Honestly, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, um, he claims, anyway, this claim, and if you believe the claim, that shows 2 is prime in z adjoined root, 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 uh, i root 3. And he says, likewise, the norm of um, 1 plus or minus square root of minus 3 is equal to 4, and that also implies that it is prime in root 3. So basically, I'll just, I'll just erase all this mess and just summarize it with a bold but unbacked up claim that the norm of 2 equals to 4 implies 2's prime in z adjoin square root of minus 3 and the norm of 1 plus or minus i root 3 is equal to 4 and that also implies that 1 plus or minus i root 3 is prime in z adjoin square root of minus 3, okay? And it's also obvious that 2 is not a unit multiple of 1 plus or minus i root 3, right? So this definitely is a failure. This, this, uh, this, this shows that unique factorization fails, right? And does that matter? Well, that matters quite a bit for the arguments we've been using, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it, it pretty much kills all this... Uh, uh, argument by breaking things into products of primes and going, ah, well, you know, prime cube must mean cubes there and so forth. All right. So how do you fix it? You fix it. What's the fix? The fix is what are called Eisenstein integers. Do you remember the Eisenstein criteria? Maybe not. That's something we'll see later in this course. I believe it's the same Eisenstein. He's from around Gauss's time, something like that, I believe. Um, so I think he was a 19th century dude. Anyway, so what, what he did was he... Uh, I got to chase down my demons here. Just give me a second. I got to recover how to write that. It's been a while. I'm trying to write the... Here, right, here, right. Right. Three. Right, so this is equal to minus 1 plus i root 3 over 2. In fact, this is equal to cosine uh, 2 pi over 3 plus i sine 2 pi over 3. This is e to the i 2 pi over 3. This is the third root of unity, right? The principal third root of unity is what this is. And I think, we'll, I think it's helpful to draw these on the unit circle um, just to kind of um, guide our, uh, what's the word, calculation here. Let me just take a second to do that. So it looks something like this. So 2 pi over 3, that's minus a half, about right here. And then when you square it, what do you get? You get 4 pi over 3, which is about down here. Right? And then when you cube it, you get back over here. So the squared is actually um, the conjugate. See, it just flips it over. And um, so, of course, that's easy to write down. That's minus 1 minus i root 3 over 2, right? And then finally, the cube is 1 again. So that's how this works. 
this is the third root of unity. And um, so notice that, check this out, so 2 times the third root of unity, what's it equal to? Multiply by 2, right? I get what? I get, I get minus 1, right? Plus i root 3, see that? So what does that tell me? That tells me that i the square root of 3, right, is equal to 2 times the third root of unity plus 1. What this little equation shows you right here is that if we adjoin the third root of unity, we automatically, you know, through sums and integer products of these things, will automatically generate i times root 3. So what that tells me is that z adjoin i root 3 will naturally be a subset of z adjoin the third root of unity. Now z adjoin the third root of unity is just what it sounds like. It is a plus b times the third root of unity, where a and b are integers. All right. And I have some pictures in my notes that I have spent a great deal of time creating for these things, all right? Um, so one of the things I guess I haven't quite proved, but um, if you try to do, where is, I thought I had that in my notes. Um, so let's see if I can, if I can just describe it. So. What does i root 3 look like? What, what is this if you draw it as a lattice? So the, the complex plane, let's, let's draw them in as points. Like, first of all, easy thing, you've got... The integers appear as the real axis, part of the re subset of the real axis, right? And then plus i root 3, right? So that gives you these guys. So I, root 3 is like 1.7. So that's, this is 1. So it's kind of like up here. So what would happen if you tried to go through that geometric thing we did, like with the Gaussian integers, where you just take the, you know, you pick two you know, you pick two complex numbers, right, z and w and c, right, you divide them, you're going to get q plus like some remainder over w, right? So when you look at these, like here's a fundamental cell, so you're looking at 1.71 da 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 for this distance, right, and 1 for this distance. So, what if your Q is the middle point? Length of that square? Right yeah, angle. right. Um, that means you get um, a half on the X mm -hmm. and root 3 over 2i. Mm -hmm. So, plus square root of 3 over 2i. Yeah. Um, I. I. Yeah, I think that's right, by symmetry. What's the norm of that? Um, let's see. Uh, 1 plus 3 over so 2, right? No, yeah, 2, no, 1. 1 would be 1, because 1 squared, three, root 3 squared is 3, 4 plus 4. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's a quarter plus... Yeah, three times three fourths, right? Three times three fourths. Because the we do three b squared. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got yourself got yourself ten fourths. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to think. You want the the remainder to be less. 
um, than the norm of the dividing number, right? There's no reason that you can't find a dividing number with norm smaller than 10 fourths yeah. that ends up landing that middle point. Yeah. So that means that the division algorithm fails and z just to join um, i root 3. However, once you add the Eisenstein integers, your grid is much denser. And so you can always find a point which can't be that far away from the grid. So like adding the half integers, it just kind of fills this in more densely, right? Like you're adding in, you know, minus one half plus i root three. So that's like, that's in the middle here, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can add one to that, you get over here. And then you, well, let me, let me erase my cell here. So then you got like here, and here, and here. And these guys down here get in there. So like it, it fills in the, um, the gaps, so to speak. And it, so now the fundamental cell is like this, right? So the furthest you can get away from all the points is kind of like the middle, right? And when you look at the norm of that, um, that works out to be a half. So the norm being a half, that's less than one. So you can, you can be sure that the dividing number has norm at least one, right? Like the smallest the norm can be is one yeah. if it's non-zero. And we don't divide by zero, so there you go. So that's essentially, the, the, you know, I have inequalities on page six which support this. But, um, yeah. So uh, interesting question then. So what I'm telling you is in the uh, Eisenstein integers, this is what these are called, Eisenstein integers. Um, uh, you can start to be bothered by that term, right? Because integer, there's half in there. Yeah. What does that mean? You know. Um, but but we'll, we'll we'll explain more why they're still called integers here in a minute. But um, before I do that, let's just uh, take our let's take a uh, take a second. What are the units in the Eisenstein integers? So we're looking at the norm of a plus b third root of unity equal to 1, right? So this is, um, right, plus b squared, the norm of the third root of unity squared b squared, I think. But the, 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 the magnitude of the third root of unity is one. It's on the unit circle. Yeah. So, wait, I'm doing something wrong here. This feels wrong. Oh, yeah, it's because that's not the norm. <laughs> Sorry. I got to define the norm. I haven't defined the norm. So what's the norm on this? Like the norm on this is by definition actually the length of a plus b times the third root of unity. Um, it's just, I think the length, maybe the squared length, let me look. Yeah, the squared length of it as a complex number, that's the norm here. Okay, fine. That's actually, that's actually what we were using before. That's not different. That, that's still, still it. But I, I need to look more at what that is. See, that's the norm of um, a plus b times what? Times um, minus 1, right? Plus i root 3 over 2. So that is a, um, let's see here, I guess I could say it's 2a um, minus b over 2, right? Plus i i times b root 3 over 2. And that is 2a minus b squared 
over a plus 3b squared over 4. Right? And we're looking for that equal to 1. So what we have then is 2a minus b quantity squared plus 3b squared equal to 4. Thank you. It's all good. So we got 4a squared, I think minus 4ab, right, plus 4b squared equals to 4. Hey, look at our good fortune. a squared minus ab plus b squared equal to 1. What are the solutions to this? Kinda. <laughs> so it turns out, yeah, you got your one, you got your minus one. Um, but also, I believe this one, this one, this one, and also this one. So. That one is um, so you can do either you can do like one one. Um, the the one is from what? It's from one zero. Minus one is from the uh, minus one zero, right? For a and b, so I'm talking about a and b, right? Um, the other solution that works here is what? Minus one one, right? Down here you got minus one minus one, and finally one minus one. All of those solve that, and they give different things, right? Like so, the units are one minus one, and then like one plus the third root of unity, or minus the third root of unity, and also what? Um, minus one. Plus or minus, well, that can't be it. Oh, yeah, it can be it. One minus one plus or minus the third root of unity. I think those are it. You can look at my other picture and think about how that is. If I take the third root of unity and I add one to it, where does it put it? So if I add one to this, puts it, the last one. puts it over here, right? Because yeah. I'm just shifting one. And if I take the, this is also equal to um, minus minus one because it's like that. And then if you um, if you add one to that, what do you get over here? You get um, Wait a minute. Oh, I'm wrong. I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't check. Check this out. So if I add one to this, I get what? I get, just get minus the third root of unity. So, my bad. It's minus one, one, one plus or minus the third root of unity, and yeah, plus or minus just the third root of unity itself. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six units in the Eisenstein integers. Just kind of neat. Um, so let me just explain to you a little bit about why we are calling these integers, okay? And that'll be it for today. Well, that and a little history. I'll say a little history. We're getting to the end. Um, so, definition, a complex number, all right, is an algebraic integer, all right, if it solves a monic A polynomial equal to 
equation with integer coefficients. In other words, it has to solve something like this, alpha to the m plus a sub m minus 1, alpha to the m minus 1, da 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 da, plus alpha um, a m, a 1 rather, alpha, plus a 0 equal to 0, where the coefficients are in z. All right. So now I can give you a better reason for why they're called quadratic integers, okay? So more specifically, a quadratic integer alpha solves alpha squared plus a1 alpha plus a0 equal to 0 for some a1, A0, and Z. Now, you might be a little worried that the Eisenstein integers are not actually an example of quadratic integers, right? Because do they solve a monic quadratic? I mean, some things are easy enough, right? Like square root of minus 3, right? If this is equal to alpha, this solves what? Alpha squared plus 3 equals to 0, right? There you go. It's quadratic integer. But what about the Eisenstein? Well, what's the key equation for Eisenstein? The, the cube is equal to 1, right? So what we have is that alpha cubed minus 1 equals to 0. Well, the beautiful thing about that is you can factor it. Alpha minus 1 times alpha squared plus alpha plus 1. Check it out. See it works. Now is alpha equal to 1? Nope. So therefore, alpha squared plus alpha plus 1 equals to 0. So that shows you that indeed is quadratic integer. All right, the third root unity is a quadratic in integer. It's a complex number that satisfies a monic quadratic equation. Then we have a theorem, which I will not prove because we're a little bit short on time, but every, I mean, I might come back to it later, but every rational number, it, the, the proof is not particularly hard. The more I look at it, the more I'm tempted to prove it. Every rational <laughs> algebraic integer Um, is an ordinary integer. Z. Like just regular integers. So it's one of those things that you basically, you know, assume your rational number is in least form, assume that there's a, you know, polynomial that it solves, you plug it in, and um, it ends up, it ends up giving you that the uh, relatively prime factors factor each other, so I think, or I or I am able to argue that one of the factors has to be plus or minus one. And the, the one that's plus or minus 1 is the denominator. So then it's something like that. Anyway, it's on my page 7. So again, it's not particularly difficult. So um, let me just tell you a little bit more about what the Eisenstein integers do. All right? So so we can talk about rational solutions. of x cubed plus y cubed equal to z cubed plus w cubed. All right. 
And um, there's an interesting story to tell here, um, and I'll, I'll recite it. Uh, this is a quote from, from Stilwell. He says, it was Littlewood who said that every positive integer was one of Ramanujan's personal friends. He says, I remember to go seeing him once while he was lying ill at Putney, which is probably a hospital. And, uh, and I had ridden the taxi cab with number 1729. And he remarked, as he met Ramanujan, that uh, it, was, it seemed a rather dull number to him. And perhaps it, he hoped it wasn't an unfavorable omen. And then he said, no. He replied, it's a very interesting number. It's the smallest number expressible as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. <laughs> like, like, how do you, <laughs> that's a number theorist, right? <laughs> so as I understand it, Ramanujan um, just couldn't deal with the British um, nutrition. Like he was used to vegetarian and like it just, he couldn't really survive the food in Britain if I understand correctly. And he, yeah, he his self-taught essentially, and uh, rediscovered most of what Europe discovered, and then some. There are still things that we don't quite understand how Ramanujan did what he did. He had some sort of insight into the things that I think we're now doing with these cusp forms and other things. Um, he had some kind of secret formulas in e either in his mind or I, I don't know. Like, there's a lot that you could say about Ramanujan, um, but um, it's mentioned also that you know that we see his name appear some in the history. Um, this guy, Brunker, I can't spell it, Brown, Browncher, 1657. So he, he, he gave this, 9 cubed plus 15 cubed is uh, 2 cubed plus, so how did they decide this is a question? I don't know. I mean, I kind of see how this, this, this uh, I mean, given what else we've been talking about lately, it's okay, I kind of get it, you know? Because we were looking at like different ways to write an integer as a sum of two squares. So this is maybe this is the next natural step, right? Um, I'll content myself with just writing these, but so this is like 4104 and uh, 34,312. And indeed, that's the first one. All right. Um, but anyway, so yeah. So that's just an interesting story. So actually, the rest of the section is about describing the solution of x cubed plus y cubed equal to z cubed. All right? And so it mentions that, um, you know, this was proved by some people using this method. Okay, so what, what were they proved? They proved that there does not exist an interesting solution. What, what's a non-interesting solution? What do you mean interesting solution for this problem? Right, yeah, so if you put one and one here and zero for the other, great, we can do that, but. So, but, so, in Stillwell, right? Chapter seven, you read it. He uses the Eisenstein integers, right? to basically pick this apart and prove that it doesn't have a solution, an interesting, an, un, an interesting solution. So you're right. This is, what is Fermat's last theorem? Yeah, so Fermat's last theorem, exact, I think, that's right, x squared plus, excuse me, not squared, we've seen there's some solutions for the square in there. So, but x, x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. All right, there does not exist interesting solution for what? n greater than or equal to 3. All right. So, the n equals 3 case you can prove using the, Gauss, the, the Eisenstein integers, all right? Um, now, 